here we go. Enjoy the sixth edition of the DVD Tome Along. Enjoy. Let's begin with, uh, yeah, Yui. So I accidentally, uh, I didn't start anything beforehand. There's only three, well, interesting, there's only three uh, sections this time around. Usually there's four. Um, but yeah, I uh, accidentally selected this, uh, I think, the other day. I actually clicked into it. So I haven't seen, I haven't read anything, but I'm just saying I accidentally started this one for the most part. Now, an engine. Echo. Shut up for a sec, and now we get to enjoy this. Anyway, enjoy. Here we go. An engine echoes through the darkness. A roar vibrates through Yui's body as she accelerates through a thick churning fog across a wasteland of crumbling pagodas and buildings. She passes a wrecked motorcycle on the side of the road. Not far from the bike, a rider tries to stand but collapses on a shattered leg. She can't stop. She won't stop. She needs to win. She needs to reach the... She's not sure anymore. She looks left and right as she zips past the ruins of her hometown. She passes the same rider again, trying to escape the blazing wreck. Doesn't make any sense. Nothing makes sense. A demon yells in the fog. The Seems only. like he's right behind her, lurking in the fog. That's the only splash screen, jump out at her. She maneuvers through piles of flesh and gore of fallen riders, burning and sending puffs of swirling smoke up into the darkness. She yells helplessly, and the dead, smoldering riders begin to evaporate into a column of light breaking through the darkness. A rider suddenly stands in front of her. She skids, loses control, and tumbles over the road. Her insides feel like mush. Things are broken everywhere. Cracked bones rip through her skin, ah. spitting out black, warm fluid. Ah. She tries to rise, but a bone jutting out of her black jeans won't let her stand. Like the fallen rider she ignored, she's broken, helpless, and soaked in gasoline. Ew. Gross. Well, at least she was wearing a helmet, presumably. Misato studies Yui closely. Ooh. To dream of fog and darkness means you see yourself as an imposter, perhaps even a failure. Yui nods and absorbs her friend's interpretation. Misato sips her beer. To see light means you'll overcome whatever is holding you back. To dream of a crash or a dead end could mean the death of something you want, something you wish for. Yui sighs and doesn't know if she wants to hear all this. The demon? The Oni? Why was it chasing me? Misato nods. The Oni could mean you're struggling to maintain your humanity as you chase your dreams. That you may be torn between right and wrong, between good and evil. Misato laughs to herself as she finishes her beer. Huh. Maybe winning isn't everything. Maybe you're greedy. Maybe you're trying to swallow an ocean when a glass of water would suffice. Yui scoffs. Greedy? I'm broke and you're paying for the beers. Misato shakes a drunken finger at her. Greed isn't just about money, Yui. It's about wanting more of anything. More races, more trophies, more fame. Maybe your need to prove yourself is killing something in you that doesn't want to die. Yui sighs and downs her beer. Enough stupid talk and more drinking. Behind her dismissive smile, 
Yui believes her nightmare has nothing to do with ego or greed, oh, so just... but the anxiety of not having the money to pursue her dream. Oh, that's, uh, that's fucking relatable, let me tell you. So, she, so this was just a dream. An engine no, shut up, shut up, shut up. She was just dreaming all of this. Um, hmm. Right, interesting, and then she talks Misato. to yeah whoever Misato is. Well, maybe I actually did not read Yui's backstory heading into this. It's one of the few. I fucking like. Sorry, not sorry to interrupt. But like Legion's backstory really fucking ruined me reading all of the other backstories that have come out since then because like, oh man, Legion got kicked or uh, what what Jimmy Jeff whatever his fucking stupid name is. Johnny, whatever his name was, um, he got kicked off the, the basketball team and now he just kills people. Like, that was just basically the, to sum it up. Like, it made no bullshit sense. Um, it was just like teen angst and all this other garbage. Anyway, so she had a dream where she saw the Oni and then this person, this Masato person, just tried to interpret it. I don't know what's up with this light, but, um, yeah, let's keep going here. Maybe winning isn't everything. Might not be everything, but it is rent money and groceries and beer for the next few weeks if she wins the Secret Four. Secret but before four, she huh? can win, she must be given a chance to race. Shinji, the favorite, has found a way to keep Yui out of the race, convincing the organizers that a female racer would undermine the Secret Four. It's chauvinistic, barbaric, yeah. dated but it's also her reality. They're not used to someone of her caliber. Caliber? Shinji has no caliber. He cheats and humiliates and ridicules to get a psychological edge. Trash talk. She knows his game, and he knows he's going to have to race her one of these days. But for now, he tells them if she races, he won't. And since he's the current champ, they somehow believe they need him to attract the money. She's sitting out tomorrow's race. But she'll be there to cheer her good friend, Hero. Mm. Sounds like Shinji, Shinji's a dick. All right. Shinji trash talks Yui as she fills Hero's ears with fighting words. Fighting words. That's what her grandmother used to call them. Words with wings that filled the mind and lifted the spirit. Words. Words are more than words. They can build, they can destroy, they can empower. They can turn mice into gods and gods into mice. That's Shinji tells quote. Hiro he's going to make an example out of him because he supports Yui. Hiro acts tough, but Yui sees those fear-heavy words crawling into his ear, feasting on his confidence and weighing him down. Shinji turns to Yui and makes fun of her hair, winks at her, and asks if she came to watch men ride. Oh. She doesn't dignify his shit with a comeback. She wants Hero to win. But the termites have taken hold. Termites? He's a shell of a rider on a bike about to crack. She whispers winning words in his ears like her grandmother used to do with her. But he doesn't know how to make those words work for him. He's lost, and the race hasn't even begun yet. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Maybe maybe she accidentally turned him on because she whispered in his ear. Maybe he's into it. Yui it's watches Hero speed off and take the lead. Shinji and others follow close behind. Maybe her words did help. Hero rounds the bend. She watches Shinji race beside him and lean in. He leans in close, extends his arm, and touches Hero's shoulder. Just touches him, not to push him or hurt him, but Oop. to annoy him, distract him. <laughs> Hero swears, loses his focus, loses control. Ooh. An instant later, he's skidding across the pavement with a wrecked bike, leaving a trail of sparks and oil. His helmet is disintegrating layer by layer against the rough pavement like sandpaper. He's he wearing a helmet. Help, but the other racers speed past him, all trying to win the prize money. Hero stands and staggers stupidly into the road. His helmet doesn't exist anymore, and his face has been raised to the bone. His mouth and lips are gone. They're just teeth where lips used to be. 
A shriek sends a oh shiver God. of fear up her spine as a car slams on the brakes, loses control, and hits her good friend. Oh! Nighty night, hero. Yui accelerates through the fog with a red-eyed demon chasing her. She what? skids out of control, breaks her legs, and drags herself helplessly through the fog. Footfalls thunder toward her, shaking the ground with every step. She looks over her shoulder, but all she sees is the thickening fog. A boot crushes her hand. Ow. She looks up to face herself. Yui awakens in a hospital by Hiro covered in bandages with tubes sticking out of him. Authorities don't know it was an illegal it is race. A trailer. If they did, they'd all end up in jail. She's not sure if Hiro can understand her, but she tries her best to comfort him. Doctor says, you're lucky to be alive. She wants to tell him he'll never walk again, but she can't bring herself to do it. She doesn't say anything. She can't say anything. One lapse in judgment, and he lost everything. Could happen to anyone. Yui closes her eyes, and for a moment imagines a world where she hunts that bastard down and kills him like a dog. Shinji for next uh, killer. Let's do it. Let's do it. Misato delivers some good news while they walk towards their favorite noodle dive. The organizers noodle want dive, her to like race that. the secret four. An unknown benefactor wants to see what she can do. Rumors echo of a billionaire wanting to help lifers realize their dreams. None of it makes sense. Yui feels many things right now, but an overpowering need to put Shinji in his place distracts her. But she knows she must put the mental lens of her focus on winning. Not payback, not vengeance, not even gossip or trash talk. Everything on winning. All in. Not just to impress All an in. eccentric billionaire, but to pay the rent and grocery bills. I feel you on that. Yui walks up a mountain path she recognizes and sees a woman standing at the edge of a precipice. She reaches out to the woman, knows something's wrong. The woman turns to her slightly and Yui realizes she's staring at an older version of herself. Gray hair, bloodshot eyes, tears streaming down her face. Older Yui stares at younger Yui with longing. Then older Yui sense. shakes her head, turns, and jumps. Ooh. Younger Yui rushes to the edge and stares down at countless bodies busted and broken over jagged rocks. All of them, her. That's the trailer of this. She has uh, sudden flashes tone. of a life she doesn't recognize. A life where she never left Hida or pursued her dream. A life where she became a teacher like her father. None of it makes sense. She covers her face with her young hands and screams and suddenly wakes up in her bed, lying in a pool of sticky cold sweat. Yeah. So she's having yeah, so she's having some like vivid fucking dreams here. Like my god. Um, yeah, that's crazy. I I'm guessing that's what we'll probably see in the cutscene here coming up. Misato smiles at Yui. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe it was a glimpse into another world. A world where you take a completely different path. In one, you become a vengeful red-eyed brute, and in another, a coward that doesn't follow her dreams. There's Yui no middle ground. I don't believe in any of that multi-world magical bullshit. Well, you say Misato that. scrunches her face when she hears magic. Not magic, quantum. Quantum bullshit. Misato munches on peanuts and sips her <laughs> beer. If it's a dream, it probably has something to do with something you are moving away from. Something you left behind. What do the cliffs signify? Yui remembers a moment with her grandmother. She remembers she was at a recreational center with her friends and cousins. She lost a relay race because her best friend stopped to see if their competitor was okay when he tripped and fell. Her teammate helped the boy up while hurt. another team took the lead and won the race. She was furious and they hadn't spoken for weeks. Yui remembered going to the precipice oh, where they shit. liked to talk hoping she would be there, but she wasn't. Her grandmother went up to see her and listened to her side of the story and sided with her friend. 
Yui vaguely remembered the talk. Her grandmother sat beside her, staring below at the jagged rocks, laughing nervously. You love danger, and more than danger, you love winning. Always have, always will. But winning isn't everything, Yui. Tell me, what's the use of winning if you lose all your friends? Who are you going to share your victories with? Yui laughs at this and calls her best friend weak. Uh -oh. Her grandmother places a concerned hand on her shoulder. She's not weak. I would say she's quite the opposite to sacrifice winning to help someone in need. Empathy is what makes us human, and if you lose this, you are... You are just a very good machine that wins. What does it matter if you gain the world if you lose your humanity? Yui closes her eyes and knows her grandmother is right. Yeah, insightful wisdom yeah. right there. There's something inside her that hates to lose, that refuses to lose, something that will drive her to win despite it all. A thing that brings out the best and worst in her. She just fucking hulks out and just like becomes the Oni and then dick sticks the grandma like Rah! bam. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Real quick, hold on, hold on. Teddy Graham break, hold on. Hang on. Not sponsored, but sponsor me, Teddy Grams. Well, I've got, I, I bought this box yesterday. I'm almost all the way through it. I have a problem. Let's keep going. Engines rattle and roar in an endless cacophony as Shinji messes with you. Good word. Everyone wants the jackpot, and she needs this money more than ever. She's been working as an assistant English teacher at a high school, but it's barely enough to get by, let alone fix her bike. Her Pay bike, teachers more. Her bike feels sick. She used to love the sound of her bike, but recently she's noticed a change. A few notes are off, and the sound just doesn't travel through her body the way it used to. All these engines singing their unique song and her bike singing something strange and off. She needs the prize money. And the sponsorship of a billionaire wouldn't be so bad either. Last thing she'll Come do on. is let this fool Sponsor disrupt me. her focus. She smiles at him after he levels an insult at her and threatens to run her off the road. Yui meets his gaze. You'll try, but you'll crash and burn just as soon as you do. She says it with the weight and certainty of a curse. Shinji tells her she should stay out of this one and let the men race. Ooh. She knows what he's trying to do. He's trying to disrupt her, mm -hmm. get in her head, change the vision of victory in her mind. He tells her the race is his. She flashes a smile. Not while I'm alive. Ooh, cold-blooded. I hope it's like, I don't know, I hope the cutscene just shows like her just murdering the shit out of Shinji on the, on the road here. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, and then she like wakes up and then comes to Oni. All right, let's see what we got. I don't need no helmet. Deuces. No. Yeah, she's yeah, he's dead. He's fucking dead. He's like, I got the money. Bum, 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 bum. And that's why you always wear your helmet when you're on a motorbike or on any sort of bike. 
Let that be a lesson to people who, who you know, think that, you know, safety is like, ah, I don't need it. And that's why you always wear a helmet. It would have been funny if he was like, ah, just <laughs> pull in your leg, haha, you lost the race. And then she fucking chokes him out, like, right there on the spot. That would have been great. Alright, well, that was a little bit different. Uh, let's see what we got here. There is a reprieve this night in the asylum. And Sally does oh, what the nurse. same person would do. There's Sally. She clings to it with all her strength. The weight that sits in her chest melts away, allowing for one starving breath. The scent of sweat and dusty linen is willed from her mind, replaced with memories of tomatoes and fresh soil. Her feet take her down the hall, heels clicking, echoing into an expanse of shadows. She does not allow herself to see the stains on the walls or the fracture in the window's pane. She could draw them from memory, but for this moment, they cease to exist. As Sally reaches the end of the hall, she peers into a patient's room, illuminated by a blade of moonlight cutting across the floor. A young girl, sitting atop the bed, flinches at the oncoming shadow. Only as Sally walks into the moonlight does the girl release her grip on a bundle of sheets. Sally offers a sympathetic smile to her. The anxious girl. The asylum's file lists her name as Marion, but the staff have codes for each patient. The catatonic boy, the sweaty codger, the anxious girl. I'm Everything the they codger. are summarized into two words. Sally sits on the edge of the bed, braiding the anxious girl's dry, brittle hair. Did you visit the community room today? The anxious girl hugs her pillow. I stayed here. A light moan carries through the hall, the first indication that peace will soon be broken. Sally does her best to ignore it, weaving one strand of hair over another. Did you know that room has a chair by the window? You can see the robins building a nest in the trees. The anxious girl looks to the hallway, her shoulders tensing as she listens to the distant moan. Sally gently rubs the girl's shoulder, wordlessly offering her sympathy. They sit for a short time, until a scream carries through the hallway. Sorry, um... Let me reread that, I had to ban somebody. Ban a bot, basically. Robin's building a nest in the trees. Anxious girl looks to the hallway. Her shoulders tense like she listens to this moan. Hmm. So again, I believe Sally is the nurse here, and also like again, they're going with the. Uh, I mean, it's hard to tell. I mean, on the first paragraph here, but it's like it seems like Sally was just you know a nice person. And then somehow we're gonna see what uh, went wrong to make them into, you know, the nurse. So it's the nurse being a good woman, a good person. Okay. Again, playing the empathy. I, I've said this for most of these. Like the, the, the killers, they play the empathy card, they, or or sympathy card for um, for the viewer to just be like, oh, they're not that bad of a person. Who cares if they, you know, murder a few people here and there, you know? She went to the whole asylum because her husband died and she had to fend for herself, yeah. It's been a while since I read uh, Nurse's Backstory. I probably should retune myself on it. I mean, most of them aren't actually willing. Yeah, I know. Sally marches down the hall to the source of the scream. Patients, each in their own rooms, react. An interlude of cries and shrieks joining in accompanied by the thumping of a head slamming into a wall. The volume builds louder and more chaotic until finally, as if reaching a crescendo, a patient howls. Sally rushes into a room, moving towards a hideously scarred woman restrained to the bed, whose scream slowly dies into soft, mirthful laughter. Did you enjoy the song, sweet nurse? <laughs> I call it Concerto of Lunatics. The asylum is wide awake now, alive, anxious. The scattered shrieks and moans of patients ricocheting through the halls. Sally's chest tightens as she struggles to breathe. Why? 
Why must you rile them? The broken woman smiles beneath the swathe of bandages over her scarred face. Through two small holes, mismatched eyes, blue and orange, sparkle. Oh, sweet nurse, what are the jesters for, if not a laugh? Sally knows to step away, knows there is nothing to gain from arguing, yet she cannot restrain herself. They are humans, and sick as they may be, they deserve sympathy. This is a line Sally has told herself many times over the years, though that is all it has become, a line. A series of carefully rehearsed words pushed through chapped lips. Perhaps this is why the broken woman chuckles as if trading quips with a friend. They deserve sympathy? Most have contributed nothing but pain, and the others have contributed nothing at all. Yeah, trickster. That's that's very ironic there. Hmm. No way. Line Sally has told herself many times over the years, though that is all ha Though that is all it has become, a line. A series of carefully rehearsed words pushed through chapped lips. Huh. Sally makes no attempt to suppress her disgust as she looks at the broken woman's smile. Oh, hold on, hold on. You Let would me read the chapter. Um, I mean, most of them aren't actually willing. Uh, like the iron embedded in the chapter, the race whole appearance, and some of the others are because they didn't want to do this and the entity forced it. Ah, yeah, that is true, yeah. Sorry, I meant to read that out loud. Sally makes no attempt to suppress her disgust as she looks at the broken woman's smile. You would criticize your fellow patients for bringing nothing to this world, yet what have you provided? The broken woman awkwardly sits up on her bed, pulling at her restraints like a restless marionette. I have provided more to this world than a thousand missionaries. When I saw sickness, I did not coddle it, feed it, wipe the tears from its eyes. I cleansed it. Well, here, have a fountain. woman sees she has Sally's attention. If we want humanity to survive, we must be its custodians, sweet nurse. And yet, we have allowed an infection to fester, the evidence pervading these walls. The broken woman pauses, allowing her point to settle. Shrieks and moans from the mentally insane echo through the halls. Sally feels her nerves tighten with each chaotic noise that comes her way. She has little desire to argue, yet duty compels. Are you not within these walls too? Would that not make you part of the infection? The broken woman smiles as if expecting this question. Sally just pukes on I her like am a plague. the solution. Condemned to the halls of the infected. Like you, I was a nurse. But I served not the patients, but the greater good. With one simple injection, I removed the weak from the gene pool. I uh -oh. watched them in their death throes, knowing my actions were backed by honest science. So few have the strength to trust. And do you know what the courts called me for following logic? Insane. <laughs> Oh, there'd be a twist. I mean, I mean, they've already established that Sally is the nurse, but it'd be funny if, like, that person, the, the crazy person that they're talking to, is actually the nurse. Like, what a twist! My name's also Sally. Ah. Anyway. The days pass, but Sally's unsure how many. She always finds herself back in the asylum, tending to the frantic, the violent, the feeble. Down the hall, the bad man has slipped his restraints again. Like a wolf, he shows no motive but to prowl for the weak, and it appears he's found his prey. He drags the naked body of the rancid son by the ankles. Blood spills from the son's head. Sally does not know if the man is dead. Calling for help, she sprints down the hall with a syringe filled of sedatives. I'm sorry, is there no security there are no at other this? nurses to come to her aid. Yeah, is there no security Financial here? restrictions have seen to that. Oh. She considers that she is running to her death this time, but there is something involuntary in her movements, as if she has become a spectator. The bad man lets go of the rancid son's ankles and turns his attention to Sally. He fails to notice Harvey Cavana, the plump orderly, round the corner behind him. 
That's Harvey not how I expected the, the bad man into now. the floor as he's done to so many patients. Sally jabs a sedative into the bad man's neck. The bad man sags in place, and with a look of bewilderment, falls to the ground. The decrepit hall is silent. Sally looks over the scene at her feet. Kavana's sizable frame hefts up and down as he catches his breath, thick arms slung over the bad man who rests peacefully. The rancid son, either unconscious or dead, lies beneath them with Kavana's boot pressed against his nostril. The smear of blood from his head goes on for oh. 30 feet down the hall before curling into an adjacent room. Sally laughs to stop herself from screaming. Sally's losing it. Yeah, I always, I always thought it was called Kavanaugh, not Kavana. That's like a silent G, silent H. Holy shit. Maybe that's, maybe that's deliberate to not confuse, maybe not to, you know, incorporate a, a current presiding Supreme Court justice with, uh, you know, a game about violence and, and all this stuff here. So maybe, maybe that's done by design. Uh, Jesus Christ. The plump orderly. That's... Yeah, kind of got, yeah. Poor, poor, the, poor the rancid son. That, I mean, first of all, that's a hell of a nickname for somebody in a hospital or an asylum, but like... That sounds like he got fucked up. Majorly. Especially with like... What was it, 30, th yeah, 30 feet of blood down the hall? Like, ugh. Sally finds herself in the broken woman's room. The mismatched eyes of the broken woman appear sympathetic as the sunlight shimmers over them, yet she speaks with sharpened words. Shame about that bloody disturbance yesterday. Boys like that are made a certain way, not built for civil society. <laughs> boys will be boys! One, well, it is as plain as the, the skin on his face. And the other, oh, the other one hides it well. But have you looked at his family's name? That will explain everything. Sally wills herself to think of a gentle lake, lilies and... No. All she can see are the grimy asylum walls and bloody bandages. Yeah. There are no gentle breezes to distract her, only the broken woman's voice prodding deeper. Did you not have a husband, sweet nurse? I recall the newspaper article, Hand a heart, my dear, I cried at his unfortunate death. You would have had beautiful babies. Oh. To now be here, a widow of pure genes serving the filth of the world. Such a turn of events. Sally gets up, oh. leaving a bandage half-wrapped. Her feet shuffle imprecisely as she moves for the door. She tries to push her thoughts away, knows she shouldn't think it, but it is such cruelty. Her love was pure, her husband pure, and those who live in these halls are anything but. Yet these sick, twisted beasts receive the care and attention deserved to the man she lost. Her throat catches on each breath. Her vision blurs. She wants to run, but knows it's no use. No matter where she goes, she always finds herself back in these halls. With swirling thoughts, one stark realization breaks through. It is not she who keeps the insane confined to these halls, but the insane who confine her. She falls to the unforgiving floor. Hmm. It's kind of, I don't know, the way that they're describing this, like, I'm surprised the asylum isn't more, isn't more of a large, like, the asylum itself isn't more of a large uh, part of the level. Because it's like, you got that circular outside bit, and then you have the, the teeny, I mean, it's like a fucking, uh, the size of, I would say, like a planetarium, basically, in the middle. Yeah, this is interesting. A lush green oh, field sorry. dotted with salmon-colored lilies and patches of pine trees surround the lake. The colors are more vibrant than Sally remembers, and though it smells of fresh rain, the sky is clear. Andrew sits next to her on a blanket, his blonde hair nearly white in the sun. She wears the dress he had bought her. A symbol of my love, he had written on the card, and for a man of few words, 
It meant many. He wipes the grass stains from his calloused hands and turns to Sally. We should get home. The lake will still be here tomorrow. A cold breeze sweeps through the meadow, bringing with it the scent of sweat and dusty linen. She grips his wrist with both hands. Oh, say, Just one more one minute. Sec. Please, one more. She hears saws ripping through lumber, the sound heightening with each violent slash. Tighter, she holds Andrew's wrist, pressing her head into his shoulder and bracing herself. An immense tree slams to the ground behind her, sending twigs and dirt into the air. One after another, they come down in booming, ground-shaking jolts. Sally coughs through a cloud of dust, keeping her grip on Andrew the entire time. A bead of blood trickles down his arm, coming to rest on her finger. She looks up to see her husband's skull broken open, spilling blood and chunks of brain. Oh. One stark white eye looks out from the carnage, focused intently on her. We would have had beautiful babies, Sally. Oh. She collapses into the crimson muck of his chest and cries. The skin on her hands flakes away, turning to dust. She loses her grip on him. Everything she was, down to the dress she wore, decays, blown away in the wind. Like I've seen in Terminator The sweaty too. hands of Cavanna shake her as she awakes on the asylum floor. Wow. I kind of lost my place there for a second. Hold on. Um... Um... So I guess Andrew was the... the husband. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So he got fucking clobbered by a tree. <clears throat> oh. Yeah, I forgot how he dies exactly as well. That's crazy. Um... Yeah, trees do be dangerous, yeah. Uh, assuming this was from, like, the 30s based on how her other outfits are, they wouldn't have really given it much space. Just there with the problem people there and forget about them. Yeah, but, like, even... I don't know. Like, the asylum in the game is modeled more so towards, like, the... You know, the attributes to the game itself with looping and things like that. It's not, it's not something like the doctor's hospital where you're, like inside for like 95% of the time and like, you know, just go up and down the halls and things like that. It just, I, I was just kind of expecting more of that with the asylum than, you know. Yeah, that is true. The asylum is also <clears throat> mainly in shambles and things like that. That is true. It would kind of explain all the debris and, and the, the rubble and the fires and things like that. So I, I, I agree with that. So far, so, so far... So for all we know, it was larger and just, it's been burned to a crisp in some areas. Okay, yeah, that's true. That's a fair point. She's in the hallway again. Oh, sorry. The scent, the stains, her heels clicking. It's the same. Occasional moans and shouts carry from nearby rooms. Short bursts of mania or terror that emerge and intermingle. The Concerto of Lunatics. Sally enters the anxious girl's room and sits at the foot of her bed. The girl flinches, but after a second's pause, lifts herself up. Illuminated under moonlight, she offers a timid yet warm smile. Sally takes three strands of the girl's hair and begins to weave a braid. Did you see the robins today? But Sally doesn't wait for the girl's answer. Another day hiding, wasn't it? What about the robins? They will be dead by the time you leave this room. Ooh. The girl's shoulders tense, and Sally feels herself do the same. Oh, so she started. takes a deep breath, attempting to calm herself. As she parts the hair back from the anxious girl's skull, she spies tiny writhing creatures. An infestation of lice crawls through the girl's hair. Sally pulls uh. her hand back and slaps the girl across her face. <laughs> Filthy! Their eyes lock. Confusion and startlement among them both. Tears trickle down the anxious girl's helpless face, wet chin trembling. Sally takes a step back. 
She thinks to apologize, to explain the stress she's been under, but something in her refuses. Filthy girl! She storms from the room. Okay, that sounded like a, a schoolyard insult. Filthy girl! Nobody wants fucking lice on them. Like, I, I don't blame Sally one bit there. Starting to lose it? Yeah, sounds like it. But can you blame her? Like, come on. Sally, her face emotionally void, sits next to the broken woman's bed. She finds herself more and more in this position, listening to the woman ramble. The broken woman fidgets with her restraints, fixated on an unscarred piece of skin at the base of her hand. Ugh. Purification comes in many forms. We must all make sacrifices. She curls a finger inwards and scratches at the clean piece of skin until it's torn off. Uh, For the most grotesque offenders, the genetic abominations, we me. must take extreme measures. Otherwise, you get, well, the results surround you. Sally sits motionless, her tired eyes the only indication that she's conscious. The broken woman speaks as if chatting with a friend over tea. Do you know what I could do? I could tell you the ingredients for my special injection, the one I used on my patients. A quick little prick and they'll writhe as if a purifying fire burns within. A fitting way to deal with inhuman filth, wouldn't you say? Are you hearing me, sweet nurse? You don't have to be their servant anymore. Ugh. Oh, so just hurt a little bit, enjoy this cocktail, and then they're gonna do Then they're dead, basically. Ooh. Or just like straight up inject the uh, tea into them. Oh wow, yeah, she definitely is losing it. Sally feels the asylum closing in on her. Whispers of paranoid lunatics spill through the cracks. She wonders how long she can walk this hallway questions if it ever ends. She passes the catatonic boy in his wheelchair, staring deep into the walls. He gazes in her direction, though his eyes look through her. Has the trial begun? He lets out a scream, pausing as if having startled himself, then laughs. Harvey Kavana, the fat orderly, emerges from a patient's room and gives her a smile. The skin on his neck dangles as he moves, glistening with sweat. Uh. A thick coat of hair covers his arms and curls over the collar of his shirt. Uh. His eyes move from Sally's feet upwards, pausing on her chest until he realizes she's watching him. His eyes dart to examine the floor as he nervously licks his mouth. Ahead, the foul girl skips gracefully, enjoying her first day out of restraints in a month. She hums a pleasant tune, tracing her hand over the wall. As Sally approaches, the girl tilts her head forward. She lets out a long, guttural sound, heaving her diaphragm until vomit splashes onto the floor. Content with herself, she smiles and skips on. Sally continues, giving no thought to cleaning the mess. She sees the shoeless imbecile sitting by the broom closet. Also me. Thick strands of blood drip from his mouth. Okay, it's not With me. With precise rhythm, he slams his jaw into the doorframe six times, digs at his gums, and pulls out a tooth. Ah! He peers at Sally as if she's the strangest thing he's ever seen. Pretty woman! Sally looks out at the hallway, stretching on forever. She stops, accepting what she's tried to suppress. The sickness can grow no more. She was a missile. Just seeing like a pretty woman and just fucking yank out a goddamn tooth. Ugh. Ugh. Last one. Sally fills the syringe as the broken woman instructed. Thick, dark liquid swirls within. A night sky void of stars. Or is the same the liquid from Yui's story? That crippled her vanishes under a sea of calm. Though her heels click with each step, she feels as if she floats, as if everything she's to do has been determined, requiring only the gentlest breeze to push her forward. She sees the sickness clearly. It has infected all, but the most hideous 
is the one who refuses to face it. The dog that doesn't know it's a dog. And so she oh, makes her bad. way to the broken woman's room. Most dogs think they're people. Strange how, for all the woman's wisdom, she is blind to her impurities. Though she removes the blemishes from her skin, she fails to judge the mismatched eyes that gaze at her in the mirror. Oh, no. But no amount of carving can remove genetics. Such a case requires extreme measures. Sally grips the syringe and prepares for what's to come. There is such filth that permeates the asylum. If she is to cleanse it all, she had best begin. Uh-oh. Uh, I don't know. Oh, God, I hope there's no eye torture in the... I, I cannot handle eye torture. I'm sorry. It's just... Oh. <clears throat> it better not be anything gruesome with the eyes here. My love for this broken woman grows. Yeah. All right. <sighs> Fuck. All right, here we go. I like her red hair. I am now the Oni! Not what I thought it was going to be, but all right. So she basically just injects everybody at that fucking place with that serum cocktail, and then that happens, I guess. Wow. All right. I, I, I for some reason, when it, it said no amount of carving can remove genetics, I thought we were going to see her, like, inject herself and then like fucking do something with her eyes that would just like it would explain why she can't see basically so all right and then this last one should be about the guy that we see with his little astrolab thing in his hand which doesn't look like it's there right now uh, which is a bug that they haven't bothered to fix but um let's see here she can though. Oh, oh. Why can't she do that in the game? Why can't she just like pull out a? Why isn't that her Mori instead of just like straight up choking at, choking out somebody? It's just like she pulls out a syringe with like black goo, and then just like puts them in, puts it into somebody, and then they just like freak out and they're like ah. That'd be kind of cool, rather than just being like oh I'm just gonna make you suffocate. Not th actually her Mori. I would say her Mori is like mid tier. It just takes a, the length of it's kind of quite long. If they ever do like alternate Moris, that should be one of them. Like she just fucking injects you with like a serum cocktail, and then you just fucking freak out. Like how hard is that to animate? You know. Anyway, moving on. Arcus two. I am going through some past scribblings, and the notes of the previous unknown occupants. And I realize I should at least try to organize them. Oh, she can Reading see? Reading oh. these notes, I decipher several voices who I am aptly calling the unknown few, who, like myself, had a fixation with the entity, and who, like myself, had an ability to experience the memories encoded in the fog. I will include my past scribblings and number them as best as I can, referring to them as Notes Obscura, or just Obscura. Yeah, obscure. To and piece together how long I've actually been here. I think I may have found my first ramblings amongst the half-destroyed journals of the unknown occupants. 
who struggled with infinite possibilities of whiling away the time except the one they probably miss the most. The one I miss the most. Friendship. Companionship. Sitting with my father drinking whiskey and watching the ancients swim across the night sky. <laughs> or just losing time with a friend in a hearty conversation about the merits of art, music, laughter, and stories. God, that's so All I have walk. now are the memories of others. Second-hand experiences that constantly remind me of things lost and half-remembered. Oh, man, I really want this guy to be, like, an unlockable uh, character or something, man. Let's keep going. Obscura. Unknown prisoners. I found scattered about this tower countless journals from previous occupants. Occupants might not be the best way to describe them. Prisoners would be more fitting. Eight or nine of them from the distinct voices I deciphered in the manifold journals I read with surprising interest and alacrity. Another good one. Some of these unknown prisoners shared my unusual penchant for beer whiskey, and stories of the macabre. Others seem to be raving lunatics, writing not journals, but senseless notes. Notes from the absurd, I call them. Strange musings and endless contradictions about places and characters observed and consciously or unconsciously improperly described. These notes from the absurd seem to start with unintelligible gibberish. They are quite different from anything I've seen or read as though written by someone driven by madness or some other motive to undermine any attempt to make sense of this world. Along with the notes, I found illustrations and survivor statements from police files and thousands of short stories in a dark chamber in the basement. Ooh. They had been piled up and set ablaze, but quickly extinguished with some sort of a putrid rotting sludge it's the black goo i cleaned the chamber and stacked all the stories in piles to go through and organize at a later date for the time being i see no reason to remove them from what i am now calling the, the chamber, chamber of, of blood, blood. Okay. chamber of blood survivor statement <laughs> fall city police department august 7th 2011 sean dent I was listening to a podcast of creepy stories with my friends, Adrian, Mia, Tina, and Bill. I can't remember which one of us figured out how to do it, but we realized that the stories were codes to pass on coordinates of locations of interest for some group or what? cult or whatever. We decoded a few other stories and came to the conclusion that these people were sending encrypted locations of places where they believe there would be ghosts. We didn't buy any of that paranormal crap, and we were just having fun drinking and decoding the stories and looking up the places on satellite maps. But when the coordinates of one story turned out to be close to us, we thought we could check out the place for fun. Adrian rented a car and we headed up to what was left of the crumbling asylum. There was nothing but overgrown ruins, but I remember this unnatural black fog and it was like we were at the asylum, but some other version of it. It was really strange. Hmm. And that's when we saw this thing. This the giant Oni. samurai with a demon mask, lurking about as though it had stepped out of one world and, and into, into another. another. He killed Mia first. <laughs> I don't remember what happened exactly, I just saw. <laughs> I saw her head thump and tumble across the ground. I don't Get fucking much. wrecked, Mia. I remember crawling out of the fog and that demon or apparition or whatever that thing was couldn't follow me. Like it was blocked by something invisible. Not long after, a man who called he himself had blood Hans and who identified himself as a detective arrived and asked me questions about what I had seen. Detective Tap. He took some notes and seemed a bit strange. Then when he heard the sirens approaching, he disappeared. Just like that. When the police arrived, the fog was gone, leaving only the... the... hacked remains of my friends. And now I'm here, and you're telling me that you don't know who that detective was, and that you want me to show you how to crack the code of the podcast. But I can't, because I don't know. That was my buddy Tina, and she's hacked to pieces, you assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I only just arrived, chopped somebody up, and then left. It's great. 
Oh man. Let's keep going. Uh, where did they include the the date in that? R real quick, I want to hear the date on that. Up Sorry, hold on. Chamber of Blood, survivor statement. Falls City Police Department, August 7th, 2011. 2011, Sean okay, Dent. sorry. Chamber of Blood, notes oh. from the absurd, Emperor Dwight. Oh. Ha, bubblegum tuna on Tuesday. Sir Regal Dwight in a thicklish purple robe and golden crown E steps out into the courtyard and greets all the peasants with good words and pizza. The kingdom cheers and Roars. This is why I want to fucking kill every goddamn joint I see in this motherfucking game. <laughs> you mean to tell me that pants-shitting asshole is an emperor somewhere in the multiverse? Like, come on. <sighs> Dwight's a problem. I'm trying to eradicate one Dwight at a time, especially those assholes that are still wearing the Xmas garb in April. See? Chamber of Blood, Harbinger of Hell, Evil Eyes, One. Hattie Kaur lifted her chai tea, let the steaming spicy cardamom and cinnamon elixir soothe down her throat, and set down her stainless steel cup in the small tubba near her ancestral village of Mohi. Is that how you say that the word? The tea warmed her insides. Yet she shivered cold with a nameless terror that mocked and poked at her like a formless apparition, reminding her that all wasn't what it seemed, and that there were nameless things that went bump in the night. Ever since Hattie could remember, she had seen and heard things beyond the veil, and she even had vague recollections of the day her parents disappeared while they were vacationing when she was five years old. She remembered the whispers the approaching darkness, and the sense that somehow they were in another reality. She didn't remember much about that time, but she remembered being taken in by her French-Canadian godparents, the Roi, the who Roi. raised her with their son, Jordan. Jordan Ra. Now Hattie and her older stepbrother Jordan were in India, filming episodes for their fairly successful web series, Harbinger of Hell, with their uncle Stefan. A fan had sought them out after having watched uh -oh. one of their episodes about interdimensional overlaps which Hattie could sense, feel, and even explore if her focus was right and she was able to tune in as she so often described her process. As their luck would have it, this mysterious benefactor had funded an entire expedition all over the world, giving her brother and uncle access to countless remote and classified areas of known paranormal activity and unexplainable disappearances. Hattie sipped her tea, listening to the villagers speak a language that reminded her of her disappeared father. And she suddenly heard a familiar voice and Quebecois accent that stood out from the rest, calling out her name. A moment later, Stefan entered the tubba with Jordan. I found the site of the massacre, Stefan said. Finish your tea and let's get out of here. Hattie sprang to her feet and followed her uncle and brother into the scorching hot day. <laughs> Chamber of Blood, Harbinger of Hell, Evil Eyes, Two. two. The thugs were ambushed That's in the valley near the movie. ruins of the old signaling fort, a turban man with a beard said. All right. I'm not sure what you hope to find here. Most stay away from this place like the plague. He stared at the older teens as if they were mad. You should have returned to the hotel like your uncle. Nothing here but the eyes, and they're probably watching us right now. Hattie and Jordan didn't answer. Oh, I want to, want to explain that their song. uncle didn't have the stomach for adventure, Private that he was more of a producer, and that he was trying to finish you. off a horror novel he'd been working on for the last ten years. Ignoring the guide's nervous ramblings, Hattie studied the white stone bricks of the ruined fort and the surrounding caves with a strange feeling that they were being watched. The guide Private said, The official story is a unit of British soldiers you? died fighting a band of thuggies. And the <laughs> a unofficial band of story, thuggies? Excuse Hattie me? To him. The guide stared at her for a long moment. The unofficial story is they turned their rifles and swords against each other. Something in these caves drove them mad. Uh-oh. 
Hattie absorbed this and closed her eyes while Jordan filmed the ruins and the caves. Calming her heart and silencing her mind, she began to hear the rising screams and cries of people being butchered. When she opened her eyes again, she could see the scintillating orange residual memories of British soldiers cutting down thuggy rebels. One thug seemed to be holding something important in his hands as he escaped the massacre. She walked through residual memories and approached the thug, staring at a piece of broken pillar in his hand. The thug desperately clambered over the rocks and rubble, charging into a nearby cave with the soldiers in hot pursuit. Jordan stepped up behind her. Did you see anything? Hattie nodded and pointed at the cave the thug had run into. The guide raised his eyebrows. And that's my cue to go, he said, turning <laughs> his back on the siblings. Not that I think you're both crazy, which I do, but I need to get home before my wife realizes I'm gone. It's my day to make rotis and pick up the kids from school. Hattie and Jordan watched the guide disappear down the rocky sun-baked valley. Then they turned and approached the gaping mouth of the cave. For a long moment, they stared into the darkness without saying a word. Jordan turned on the flashlight of his cell phone, and just as they prepared to enter, they heard the crunch of stone behind them. Brother and sister turned slowly to face oh. the barrel of a rifle. That sounds like the plot to like one of the, the mummy movies there a little bit. Wow. Uh... Sorry, I was too busy singing. I kind of missed a little bit of the beginning here. Uh, I also, I, I fucking can't get over Emperor Dwight being a thing somewhere in one of these little universes. Fuck Dwight. <laughs> that fucking pants-shitting pissant cannot be a fucking emperor anywhere. Not if I can help it. Anyway, uh, let's keep going. Sorry. Chamber of Blood. Sorry. Harbinger of Hell. Evil, Evil Eyes. Eyes. Three. Three men speaking an ancient unknown language forced Hattie and Jordan <clears throat> through the dark and seemingly endless cave with flickering flashlights to illuminate the way. Somehow these captors knew Hattie had a gift and were barking orders for her in broken English to lead them to the place where the thuggy rebel had hidden the relic. Uh -oh. She didn't recognize her captors, but it wasn't the first time someone had forced her to find something with her special abilities. Hattie followed a trail of residual memories, memories and whispers only she could see and hear. She could sense they were walking through an overlap of realities, which heightened and reinforced her abilities in an inexplicable way. She followed the scintillating orange trail and froze when the residual soldiers suddenly disappeared. Then she started when the soldiers blinked back into existence, and she heard desperate screams as something she couldn't make out attacked them. What is it? One of her captors asked. She's seeing something, Jordan said. Let her do her thing. This had better not be a trick. Hattie watched the indiscernible creature rip the soldiers into an unrecognizable mess of flesh and gore. The creature then snatched the thug and dragged him screaming through a series of interconnecting tunnels. She chased after the fading memory, entering a small cavern as she watched the thug release the relic as the creature dragged him into a smaller tunnel that she imagined led to a feeding den. Or maybe not. Memories burned out like dying embers to reveal a cavern of human bones piled over thick, rotting sludge. She winced at the stench of fermented organs and fluids and waved a cloud of flies away from her face. Near one pile of bones was a corpse, still warm, flayed from head to toe, eyes missing, mouth transfixed in an agonizing scream. The captors stared at the corpse for a long moment before one prodded Hattie with the barrel of his rifle. What the hell did this? One of their captors murmured in disbelief. There must be a bend in reality here, another captor offered as an explanation. Hattie noted that what she called an overlap, these men called a bend. It was clear that they had an understanding of other dimensions, and that somehow this piece of column was more than just a relic. Where is it? The leader prodded Hattie. Where's the relic? Hattie took a moment, then pointed at a pile of bones. 
but it could also be in there. She motioned toward the tunnel that led to the feeding den. Check the bones, one captor ordered the siblings. Jordan and Hattie kneeled in the sticky sludge and rummaged through the bones as the leader turned toward the shadowy tunnel. He inched close to the opening Sorry. and flashed a blade of light inside. While the other two captors were dealing with flies and covering their noses, Hattie found the jagged piece of column and stealthily slid it over to Jordan. A sudden chatter of teeth and hissing made them all turn to the leader. He searched the darkness with a beam of light that suddenly, momentarily revealed a grotesque creature with a face covered by dozens, if not hundreds, of glowing red eyes. Okay, it's not Demogorgon. The leader brought the beam back to his face as the creature hissed and revealed a mouth filled with needle-like teeth. An instant later, the creature grabbed the flashlight and pulled the leader inside the den. The other captors stumbled, dropped things, and fired stupidly into the darkness. Hattie instantly grabbed a fallen flashlight, looked at her brother with wide, desperate eyes, and yelled for him to Maybe is Demogorgon. Run. Yeah. If that is if that actually is Demogorgon, that would be a hell of a fucking uh outfit skin for sure. I'm sorry, these two have like a, a popular web series and they're filming this? Like, what? And she can just she just knows that there's like an overlap and has like a special ability to like sense things. Like what the fuck? Get them views. Although probably you'll, you'll get demonetized on YouTube if you uh, you know show evisceration, uh, 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 yeah, evisceration things like that. I don't think Susan Wojcicki would be happy about that. Anyway, let's keep going. Chamber of Blood, Harbinger of Hell, Evil Eyes. Another long one. Four. Jordan and Hattie rushed through the cave with the screams and cries of dying brutes echoing through the bowels of the mountain. What was that thing? I didn't get a good look, and I don't really want to, Hattie yelled, and she could see the sunlight ahead, but sensed they wouldn't make it. Keep going, she yelled, and turned to face the darkness with only a flashlight. The hissing and crumbling faded to silence. She had no idea what she was going to do next. She narrowed her gaze, waiting. Teeth suddenly chattered, and a hundred red eyes bore down on her. Hattie inched back and fell to the ground beside a skeleton holding a cookery in one hand and a That's revolver in that. the other. She instantly wrenched the weapons out of its bony hands and clambered to trembling feet. I gotta play that. The in, creature in, uh, approached before. slowly, hissing and chattering, its terrible eyes fixated on her. She stared at long arms and fingers with claws like knives. She lifted Still her arm like and aimed the revolver at its head. Then she pulled the trigger and nothing happened. Oh. At the revolver, then back at her. Shit! <laughs> the creature hissed, then attacked with a roar. Hattie evaded. Terrible claws swished overhead and hit the wall. Bits of rock and stone rained over her. Covered in debris, she sprang up and ran with the creature in pursuit. She turned in the gathering dust and instinctively felt the attack before it came, as she often did. With one quick thrust of her arm, the blade of the cookery severed the hand. The creature shrieked something terrible. Hattie seized the opportunity to sever the head, but the creature lunged away and the blade hit the stone wall. The cookery vibrated out of her hand and she dove to the ground as the creature charged her. Tumbling away, Hattie instinctively grabbed a slab of stone. The creature attacked and missed, hitting the wall. Without hesitation, Hattie smashed the slab over its bewildered head oh with a God. terrible crunching sound she wouldn't soon forget. The creature collapsed, and Hattie, adrenaline rushing, <laughs> bludgeoned the head and eyes. When there was nothing left but a sticky, warm pulp, she released the gore-covered stone uh. and fell back on her haunches to gather herself. But no sooner did she relax than she heard the rising crescendo of chattering teeth echoing through the darkness. With an almost defeated sigh, he just Hattie pissed off the nest. Feet. White fear flashed through her mind as the chattering and hissing grew louder and louder. Teeth clenched as thousands of red eyes flared up in the inky blackness of the cave. She backed away slowly then spun on her heels and ran. Alright, so if that's not Demogorgon, then whatever the that monster is sounds amazing. 
But, it, I mean, it. one could assume that it, it's probably Demogorgon. I don't think they can... It's it's kind of weird, and, like, and this was... I was going to say this for the end, but apparently, according to certain leaks and things like that, um, they're going to be renewing uh, the Halloween license, and they're going to be redoing Haddonfield and doing, like, a special... Um, uh, excuse me for just a second here. Hold on. Ooh. Ooh, one moment. Sorry. Um, they're going to be doing a... Uh, hmm. Excuse me for just a second. Oof. Hold on. I get my <laughs> I'm getting a little excited here. They're getting um their own uh tome work and things like that done. So they're gonna be able to do like actual uh lore based stuff off of the franchise. So um yeah, that's interesting. Uh they might be doing something like that here, but they're not actually saying that it's Demogorgon. So Yeah, sorry, I got a little lightheaded there for a second. Sorry about that. Uh, let's keep going. Ugh. Chamber of Blood. Evil Eyes Five. Harbinger of Hell. Evil Eyes Five. Hattie hell charged movie. toward the mouth of the cave with millions of eyes and chattering teeth on her heels. She felt the swipes at her back, but never wavered. She vaulted wildly out of the mouth just as one creature lunged at her. Hattie tumbled out of the cave as the creature hit an invisible barrier where the overlap of dimensions ended. Ooh. She turned to see the dark mouth of the cave fill with scathing red eyes. Jordan stepped up behind her. Helly Hattie does it again, <laughs> he said with a laugh. Hattie gave her brother a dirty look. <laughs> Don't, Don't call, call me, me that, that, she said curtly. <laughs> Even though he had meant no harm, it was a name along with the harbinger of hell children used to call her because bad luck, strange Aww. things, and unexplainable accidents seemed to follow her. Years of therapy gave her the courage to accept her abilities and to boldly call her series the Harbinger of Hell. Exhausted, Hattie sat on a sun-baked stone and watched the red eyes slowly disappear from the gloom of the cave. Did you catch the creature on your shirt, Cam? Nope, forgot to hit record. Jordan shook his head as he sat beside her. She didn't think he would as creatures or relics from other worlds didn't register and often left blurs or glitches. Oh. Or that. Jordan sighed and handed over the relic they had recovered. What do you make of it? Hattie held it and felt great misery. In her mind's eye, she saw cloaked figures hiding pieces of the same pillar in another world. She shrugged and kept what she had seen to herself. Uh -oh. Then she pulled out her cell phone and handed it to Jordan. He centered her in the frame and indicated he was filming. Hattie cleared her throat, Oops, mopped her forehead of sweat and soot, looked into the lens, and proceeded to address her online followers. My name is Hattie, and I was born with a wonderful curse. All my life I've attracted strange and unusual things, and when I was 12, I realized I was able to acquire insight to unexplainable events and otherworldly places. She took a moment to calm her racing heart. Jesus, she swallowed her one. fear, remembered she had a series to sell, and forced energy and pep into her voice. Yeah, you gotta amp it what up here. What do you here. need to know about India? It's where my father grew up, and it's where I am today to explore the urban legends of this amazing country. Hattie took a moment to find her words. Our adventure begins in northern India, at a strange place locals call the Eyes or the Valley of Evil Eyes, where hundreds have disappeared or died, including a unit of British soldiers in the 1800s. What happened to these soldiers? Where did they disappear to? And is there any merit to the accounts of a cave-dwelling demon with eyes around its head that burn right through the soul? Hattie stared meditatively into the camera and wanted to say yes to every one of her questions but decided it was better to leave them up to interpretation. After a dramatic pause, she finished. Take a look at what we discovered. Judge the evidence for yourself. And see if there is any truth to the evil eyes of, of the, the Himalayas. Himalayas. And it's just blurry, glitchy footage. All right, well, that's interesting. Let's see, uh... So the, the observer here found is just basically here, let me take off autoplay. So basically 
Yeah, he just yeah, he's going through past scribblings and he came across this. No, not 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 Emperor Joy. Evil eye, yeah, all the evil eyes there. Yeah, I really wonder if this is just like Demogorgon of some sort, and then it's like it, I, I don't know how they can get away with that without just being like, it's Demogorgon, but not really Demogorgon, you know? And if it's not Demogorgon, then whatever the hell this is would be a hell of a killer. Maybe it's the next thing coming up. Let's see. Let's take a look. Hell of a story. Oh, there he is, yeah. Power, the charm. Oh, this is a lot of books. Oh shit. It's him. And the plot thickens. Uh-oh. Huh. Interesting. So he's going through all these files, and then... How is he in the middle of, like... He's like in the middle of nothingness, and then he gets to his tower, and he finds himself a lot more aged, and then like a lot more dead. But how is that not just him in like a different, in like a different, uh, like multiverse or something like that? It could just be like something like Yui that she dreamt up, where she was, uh, um, you know, like her older self jumping off cliffs and things like that. <sighs> hmm. Plot thickens. The plot fucking thickens. Man. Um, well, that's going to be... Well, that, unfortunately, that's where it uh, leaves off for right now. Uh, with the current tomo. I was hoping we would have gotten another, like, set of stories there to listen into. I think this one... Um, usually I like to rank the best ones. I think this one... I, I was really... I really like the the evil eyes stuff here and I honestly thought we were gonna get like a tidbit of of that with the way that they set it up I'm like here here's uh, what we've seen on the evil eyes of the Himalayas but instead it's that guy climbing the tower which is the what the charms based off of and then shocked to see himself uh, <laughs> dead and out of whiskey so I think that was probably the best one a little bit it, it's leaving me a lot more confused than anything. Also, the, um... Yeah, if I can go back to this one. I really, The way this one was going, I really thought there would have been, um... Like, some sort of, like, hidden element in one of the levels where you can find, like, some sort of tchotchke. Uh, the way that was setting up. But instead, it was like, no, Oni came in and fucking wrecked everybody. Um... And Bert, no, fuck it, Bert Dwight. And then I would say Sally was probably the, the second best, and unfortunately I would say Yui was probably the third best. Although I was a little bit more uh, invested in the Yui story as well, because she was trying to beat the uh, the asshole, the chauvinistic asshole in a race, but she ended up caring about him more than than I thought she would. I would have just been like, peace, I, I give me that uh, sweet prize money, I want to upgrade my bike. I want, I want this shit to be looking like something out of Tron. Um, but yeah, uh, interesting stuff. I'm very surprised. I'm very surprised because they never showed, um, what they had in the, the trailer with, <laughs> with Yui choking out grandma. Uh, that's why I made that, that joke earlier. Uh, that never really, I mean, they, they depicted it in one of the, 
the story logs, but they never actually... I thought that's what uh, they were going to do. I thought for a second they would just be like, oh, here's Yui, and she sees all the, the dead older Yui's, and then she chokes him out to break the chain or something like that. So, um... Yeah, a little bit of a shorter version of the, the tome this time around, but it is what it is. Um, Thursday, since we're sitting at... I'll we'll back out real quick. Also, i got to turn the game down. It's super loud in my ear. Turn down 35 there, back to that. Um, yeah, if that was Demogorgon, if that actually was him, like, imagine having, like... This, this fucking thing. It, it honest to God, describe actually accurately described uh, him, but with like way more eyes. So yeah, if you can imagine like a skin with like a hundred eyes, like up here on the uh, the head and neck area, that'd be crazy. So I kind of hope that happens. Um, but yeah, uh, rumor is like we're on the street. Take it for a grain of salt or whatever. That they're going to be doing like a Halloween themed uh, a tome of some sort. So, if they actually can pull it off and like have stuff incorporated with the, the Halloween franchise lore, that'd be really neat. And uh, I'd be looking forward to that. So I'm wondering if they if that would somehow tie, or rather, uh, the evil eyes stuff would somehow tie in with like the the demogorgon with the overlapping dimensions and things like that and he gets like a hundred eyes skin that'd be kind of neat so but for right now uh that's where we're just gonna leave it for the time being let's see what time we got uh 1237 we're gonna do one run of isaac here so we swap that um yeah that was uh tome six i it left me it left me wanting more and questioning even more things as well so uh, there we go